Hello, Neil. Hi, Don. Hi, how are you? Doing great. How are you doing? Really good, thank you. And I always ask this question, um, where are you calling from today? So I am in sunny South Africa um, from Cape Town, um, where we are just heading into summer. So it's heating up over here while I, I watch all of my clients wrapping up, getting trying to keep warm. Um, but where are you? Korea. Okay. And we've got the exact opposite weather. Uh, it's actually the coldest weather that we've experienced. We went in the minus today. Wow. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. We rarely hit that here. Rarely. <laughs> it was sharp. Like as soon as you step out, it, it, it stings your cheeks. Um, it's hard to breathe. It's tough yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, great. So Neil. Yeah. A lot of things to discuss. I mean, you're doing some great work with your clients. Um, I want to unravel each and every one uh, that you're doing because it's amazing work. And I want to pass that off to our coaches that are watching this. And as you know, we've got an audience that um, watch our videos and um, they become our clients um, soon after. So yeah, I'm going to share some good insight to those people as well. Um, so without further ado, can I have you introduce yourself to our guys? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm originally from the UK. Um, so I'm teaching British English mostly, although I can adapt. Um, I understand all American spellings as well. Um, and I, I've had quite a, um, a long career. So I initially, I started in marketing communications um, in uh, the automotive industry. Um, I worked in consumer electronics um, and other uh, technology industries. And in the corporate world, my last role was really was in um, a video games company. Um, throughout all of that, working on writing compelling copy, um, engaging consumers in um, product descriptions, and using English as a tool to promote business and, and, and sales and marketing. Um, I then switched, moved into government, working on economic development, um, primarily the creative and cultural industries in London, um, and focusing mostly on the computer games, but, but focusing really on how industry and government work together. So the public and the private sector, and translating between the two different languages, because they are different and any, any potential clients who work in that sector will know that when you come from the corporate world, a consultancy, and you go into a government department and have a meeting, there can be a lot of miscommunication. Mm. Um, and I'm currently in academia. Um, I'm studying for a PhD in politics. Um, I've been at the University of Cape Town in South Africa for the last eight years, um, as alongside doing my own studies, um, which is largely around political economy. I also teach um, and uh, mentor students. And this is a country with 11 spoken languages, 11 official languages. Most of the students I work with don't have English as their first language they'll have it as the second or third language. And a lot of the work I do is enabling them to engage in academia, um, but coming from a, the disadvantage of not necessarily being fluent or as fluent as everyone else in English and having to produce academic work in English. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of my brief biography. And it's a dynamic one. I mean, you've been in private, public, um, yeah you're a writer, uh, you're a coach, you're a mentor, you're a teacher. So with that diversity, right, um, it allows you to connect with a lot of different types of clients. Yeah. So as you know, we have a lot of the senior leaders working for big organizations and they become a client of yours. Um, and then you told me this, that you're able to draw 
something out that you learned 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. And that becomes a very big connection point, right? Yeah. Could you yeah. elaborate on that? Absolutely. Um, so it's, it's interesting because at the moment I have, um, I, I probably have a client from each sector that I've worked in. Um, and um, I've been through lots of transitions. I have clients who are going through transitions. Um, and they are, they're, they're very senior executives. And when I was working in government, I was mainly dealing with senior executives and, and working out how we can grow industries. Um, and what really fascinates me is being able to engage with a client from the automotive industry on what's, re what's happening now, how cars are changing, how the markets are changing, how marketing is changing, um, the games industry, um, other marketing and sales areas. And it gives me an opportunity to keep really current on what's happening. So I do a lot of work around artificial intelligence because it's a big issue for marketeers. Um, and, but also I've, I've had clients who are working, trying to get government contracts. And so I know what it's like to engage across those fields. And I love getting back into it because academia can, can as well as it's rewarding working with young students, undergraduates, um, they're not necessarily uh, they're at the cutting edge of the research that we do, but these industries are growing and they're booming and things are changing all the time. And it's, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's almost, it, I, I don't, it's a bit like a hobby to just be able to sit and have really in-depth conversations, you know, and spend time interrogating some of the research that we use as material for our classes um, so that, Sometimes I think I get more from the sessions than the clients do, but I know that they value it. And I know that they value the language that we're doing and the fact that we're working with material that keeps them at the top of their game. Um, because it's, it's tough. They, they, they are very busy and they don't have time to go to all the seminars um, around the topics that are actually really important for their work. Um, so I can combine both. We can learn English, we can learn artificial intelligence, we can look at how data science is having a severe impact on, on logistics or um, consumer purchasing decisions. Um, yeah. Now, with that point, um, before I get into my, my next question, the, the idea that um, you're learning as well. I mean, the discussions mm. that you're having are so rich and so powerful because these clients are thought leaders and they've mm. been in their industries for years. So yeah. what they're able to um, communicate to you could be so fresh because it's just different information sometimes, right? So that's one of the perks of being a coach. Because I remember when I was um, coaching full-time, um, I really enjoyed learning. From them. Yeah. Like I really learned a lot of different things that I couldn't get from books or articles or videos. Yeah. And that's what I love, you know, and I'm sure they feel the same way. So it's reciprocal. Um, yeah. Information ex is exchanged. Um, and that's one of the powerful things from our engagements. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, I want to stress, I don't, I don't, I'm not sitting and just listening to what they're telling me. I'm going out, going out first, doing the research so that I can come to the table with an ability to understand. And then as you, and then what I, so what I really love doing is we'll have a class where we talk about, we'll start easy, easy questions, define these terms. What do you understand by this? I build an understanding then of the, the range of their vocabulary. Next, let's look at how this article that we've read has explained these terms or how they've been implemented in, in this industry. Then you move on and say, right, let's think about your industry. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? What mm -hmm. can you be doing? What should you be doing? What are your competitors doing? And all the time we're switching, we're moving from speaking in the present tense, speaking in the past tense. We get into working on the conditional, you know, we start thinking about the future. Um, so yeah, absolutely. 
it's, it's, um, I'm in academia because I love learning. I'm very focused on the politics, but I've been working for many years and I have all of these interests that I can keep reigniting through the clients. I like to hear that, Neil. I like to hear that a lot. So my, my, my question to you was going to be this. Because you're dealing with a lot of the senior leaders, um, they've got a pretty dynamic schedule, a lot of impromptu meetings. They've got, they're working around the clock because a lot of their partners and colleagues are different regions and sometimes in America, right? So yeah. how do you handle that? Because I know when I'm speaking with soon to be clients, one of their major concerns is, Don, I don't think I'm able to do two classes a week. That's, that seems like a lot to me. So there, there is a little bit of overwhelm. So how do you yeah. handle that for, with your students? Okay. So, you know, really to back up what you're saying, I, I have clients who I meet at 11 PM their time, 10 30 PM their time. They're really, they, they want to learn. They understand the importance of English and the importance of having regular sessions, but they have a packed day. And so they schedule it as whenever they can. And it might be after the family have gone to bed. Um, so there's that. Mm. One of the other things is I'm my time zone means that when they're finishing their day or when they've just finished their dinner, I'm waking up, I'm full of energy <laughs> and my day is, is kind of just beginning or part of the way through. Mm -hmm. And so it means that I'm, I'm fresh. So even if they're feeling a little bit worn down by some hectic, hectic schedule, I can sit and I can, I can follow and listen. And it's important as a, as, as a coach, you pay attention and you're aware of sometimes nonverbal skills that suggests that their energy is a bit depleted. Um, and then what you might do is adapt the class, the two hour, the two, two classes a week. Um, if you set an article for them to read, set it so that they can look at it at the weekend. They have, they can set aside some time. Some of them do work at weekends. That happens quite regularly, but generally they'll find some time where they can read through it and make a note of the vocabulary, engage with it. Mm -hmm. So your first session then can be based on that. Mm -hmm. Later in the week, you might be able to continue talking about it, or, um, but maybe not. And so one of the things that I will do is focus on some of their other aims. So if, for example, I have a client who says, I have to give a status update um, every month to my boss in the United States, then I'll say, okay, well, the second part of the week or this class today, let's rehearse that. We'll role play. I'll be your boss. You tell me how you're achieving against your strategic objectives, you know, what's happening with recruitment. Um, there are times when even those strategies might be a bit much. And then I'll focus on something else. If I know that a client is including some popular culture within their self-study program. So, you know, keeping immersed in English at all times, perhaps by watching a Netflix show, then I'll ask them, okay, what did you watch this week? Um, recount the story and we'll focus on um, using adjectives so that you're describing things to me because I can't see it. Using the past tense, so you're recounting it in a, in a, in a grammatical way, gram grammatically correct way. Um, some of my clients, their aim is ultimately to move overseas. They're working at huge international organizations and there are countless opportunities um, in many different English speaking countries. So you can also bring something else in, have a conversation about schools, talk to them about their, their family, um, and then think about the language and vocabulary that they need to be able to engage with the school system in a different country. Mm -hmm. You have to be adaptable and mm -hmm. you have to make it fun and you have to keep the energy up if you can. Um, because as long as they're engaging in English, they're still getting a benefit from it. 
I learned this from, um, I haven't mentioned, but I, I studied Japanese in my, when I was first at university. Um, it's a completely different language to the languages I was currently studying. The teacher was amazing. Um, and for me, it was, every class was a break from studying. Mm. We would just sit, we would, we would have an enjoyable time and you came out of it having learned Japanese, but also feeling rested. Nice. Um, I think, I think that languages can do that. that you know, they're, they're such a switch from what you might be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. They use a different part of the brain. And so you, you, as a senior executive, you shouldn't feel, oh my God, you know, can I really do another class? Because just go in there and discover, learn. I'm going to draw something from right there. I think this could be a very key discovery. And to be honest, it, it might not be, but to me right now it is. And what I, want, what I want to say is as a second language learner, our clients for English, learning English and using English has been stressful. Right? Mm. I wouldn't say it's in the positive realm. It's usually more in the negative stress, high stress realm. So your condition, and your brain is conditioned that when you're having to use English, whether it's reading, listening, speaking, you're stressed out. Yeah. yeah. But what you said was when you had your Japanese class, you came out rested, right? You mm. had fun and you came out rested. Now, that's a brilliant teacher, right? And that's an amazing environment to be in as a class. But if you're able to condition that on a recurring basis where yeah. if you condition your, your your brain that whenever you're using English, uh, Japanese, um, it's fun, rested, mm. enjoyable. Could that also transpire in other, outside the classroom when you're speaking Japanese? Mm. And if so, as a job, as a coach, we should make it enjoyable for our clients. We should make it, you know, have them feel rested, kind of switch it from being high stress to, like you said, yeah. enjoyable, rested. So that may be that with that conditioning, it could transpire over to their work life yeah. and reduce that stress level and have them speak English a bit more confidently and fluently. I think, I think a lot of what we notice, what I notice with clients initially is there's a lot of anxiety around, um, um, speaking, not all of them, some of them, I mean, you know, I have some, some very, very competent, um, language speakers who are really just looking to tweak the edges and get to a point. Um, I have one who's, whose real aim is to do a Ted talk. Um, yes. and, um, you know, and, and recognizing that to be an industry leader, speaking in English at that level is what's going to be required. Um, and, um, yeah, but, the, but some come, it's a lot, often it's about confidence. One of the things I recognize that the teacher, my Japanese teacher would do is celebrate every win. Um, and what we do because we're, we're working online is we use nonverbal clues. So, you know, I, I nodding and, you know, thumbs up things that I wouldn't necessarily do in a, in a classroom, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. you want people to. And you can see flashes when you give a nonverbal clue that they've self-corrected in exactly the right way. You, you see their eyes light up because it's a win. It's a little win. Um, and that then gradually over time builds confidence. Um, and I think that, that they then experience opportunities to then have conversations out of the class where they come, they can come in, come back and say to me, we had a conference call. I understood everything that they were saying and I was able to introduce some new ideas, you know, and those are the kinds of wins that we're also looking for because we know then that they're making progress. Absolutely. Yeah. And as a coach, uh, you're, you're giving them that reinforcement with mm -hmm. those verbal cues and with enough of those, it, it gets imprinted in their minds whether it's subconscious or conscious, and it does play a, a, an effect in the real life. Because I know me, that's what my coach does. I'm a Korean teacher, right? 
and he, he's brilliant with that. Um, and and I know that when he does give me those compliments and those small wins, it's genuine, it's real. So yeah. I feel yeah. even more confident with it. Um, so I think I had this discussion with a previous coach on a previous call where um, praise, we don't do that enough in, in our yeah. relationships. I don't think doing that as a coach can really help instill some great confidence in our students and their ability to communicate at a higher level in their real world. And that, that is really, as you say, the praise, it's one of the things you learn when you're mentoring and coaching is that actually that's, 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 that's part of what they're looking for because often people aren't achieving their goals because they don't recognize the steps they're taking towards achieving them. Yes. They have an idea of the goal, but they don't recognize that they are making progress because no one's telling them. And if you can then reinforce to them the fact that they are, you know, even if it means at the end of the class, toward the last five minutes, you say, I want to point out to you, because you won't have noticed, mm -hmm. but you use every plural correctly, this, mm -hmm. this session. You mm -hmm. self-correct it the first three times, and then for the rest of the session, you got it all right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Exactly. It's really important. I think we're on something here and I want to transition into something that you're doing as well as most of our uh, coaches, uh, the soon to be coaches that are watching, you'll get a, a very good understanding of what makes it special. Yeah. The IFO, right? Yes. Yeah. Are you able to, can we get into that now or should that, yeah. should that be, yeah? No, no, let's, um, here we go. Uh, one of the advantages of the, the software that we use for classes um, gives us the opportunity to share um, our screen and it, it really is invaluable. Um, mm. So I have here what we call our IFR, Instant Feedback Report. Mm. Um, some clients, I keep it open throughout the class. Some clients, I'll open it up towards the end of the class. Mm. And in this, I keep a record of um, corrections that are made mm -hmm. um, as the conversation is flowing. So I'll listen and while I'm listening, I can make a note of errors that perhaps um, I want to either in real time correct or with some clients, I'd rather wait 10, 15 minutes or until they come to the end of a speech or a presentation and then work back through. Mm -hmm. The point is that when you're correcting somebody's English, so I've made this a bit larger so they can, you can see it. Great. Here, for example, to enhance their process and management level, it's simply um, an error in plural. Mm -hmm. So it should be to enhance their processes and management level. Mm -hmm. Now, I can tell you that, and you might remember it. Mm -hmm. If I show you it on screen, it becomes a visual memory as well as an oral, uh, an oral memory. Nice. Um, and, you know, if depending on the level of the client, what I might do is not put in the correction, but mm. ask them to reread the sentence and tell me where the, where the error is. Nice. Um, here, for example, um, again, it's quite a common problem that comes up is, when I present to chairman, it's actually, we need the definite article because it is a very specific chairman that you're presenting to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the second one, uh, the, so the second one on this page, we've got somebody using um, an adverb and when actually they need to be using a noun. Sure. Um, um, and, you know, it's, that's a simple correction to make. Simple question to make, but completely different meaning if it's... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I think we've... Yeah, I think... What was this one? Ah, here we've got, here we've got um, another error that arises sometimes where um, they're using the wrong form of the verb. Mm. Um, so sometimes, sometimes I influencing the chairman. Mm -hmm. Now... We have two, two, two types of present tense. You can say sometimes I influence the chairman or sometimes I am influencing the chairman. And what they've done is they've kind of mixed and dropped the am 
um, and we can work through that and we can talk then about which is the most appropriate in the context of what they're doing. Yeah, I find this a really valuable tool. It is. Um, and sorry, Neil, were you going to say continue? I, I was going to say that there are other sections where we can then add new vocabulary. So here, for example, the word, um, the, the client wanted to say, I think they said something like, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of options. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, that's great. But if you say there are a multitude of options, particularly if you're writing some copy and you want, or if you're writing a, um, an update to um, your senior management level, you want to be learning words like multitude rather than saying lots and lots of. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Again, writing it on the screen helps them to remember. Mm -hmm. um, and then we give the meaning and then we can practice it. And you, and you got, do you have the example sentence onto the right hand uh, side? Let me have a look. Uh, so here we have, so we were talking about procurement mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about an organization that needed to be more efficient in its procurement. And one of the sentences that came up was that they had many, many um, procurement options. And so we can say it's a multitude of procurement options. Yeah. You can probably tell this is a client who works in um, data management. Yeah, data science. Our clients love that kind of feedback where it's like they they're missing that word that can really make it concise as opposed to using that lots, many, many, many. And yeah. Giving yeah. them that word, that verb, that adjective really puts a smile on their face. Yeah. That's what they want. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, right. Let me get back to our full screen. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an area where I, I particular. It's, it's something that I particularly enjoy. I, I, um, I like language. I studied. I've studied a number of different languages, and I, I like the adaptability of language. Um, and in academia and in marketing, brevity um, is key to a lot of what you want to do. And also, if you're writing a strategic plan, if it's waffle, it'll get rejected. Um, you're writing it in a foreign language, you want to be able to use words that help you be very concise, but accurate in what you say. Um, and that is what we're teaching. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And last question before we go, because I know we're going over time here, Neil. Um, I, I, there's a few key words from, from today's call. And one of the key words I'm getting is adaptability being able to adapt. How do you adapt when you have students that are not so keen on being corrected, on being shown their weaknesses, their flaws? It, you must have had clients like that. You know, I, I have to say it's very rare. Mm. The clients we attract are really keen to learn. And one of the things that I, I anticipated is, um, is meeting some resistance, particularly because we're dealing with people who are really high up in their organizations. Right. Um, but what I, what I really value is that, that, uh, that they value the feedback so much. Um, there are times when you can notice that somebody's too keen to be speaking. And so it's a struggle to um, get them to focus on those changes. Or, or the corrections, but then that's when this tool comes in because you stop what's going on and say, look, let's look at this. Okay. You know, okay. and, and then you introduce a visual and a visual interrupts their flow of speech. Um, uh, I mean, you, you need, there, there's times I had a student where they loved, they loved it so much that they would just cut themselves short and and just look at the feedback and say, okay, so what, what am I doing wrong here? So they're just so focused on that correction and, and that mistake that yeah. they're not speaking. And that's, you know, yeah. you're not doing that in real life. So sometimes yeah. I have to just shut it off and say, hey, I'm not sharing the screen with you. I'm going to bring it up later, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 
Well, I, I guess I think I mentioned already. You know, one of the biggest challenges is 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 their 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 availability and their and their energy at the end of the working day, um, and so you have to be adaptable to that. Um, but it still surprises me that you know I'll be dealing with somebody who has a team of countless people working beneath them, and they're apologising because they haven't read. Um, whatever article I've, I've assigned them. And I'm like, look, you don't have to apologize. I understand where you're coming from. It's important. Maybe we work on your self-study program so that you schedule um, proper time to, you know, actually set aside time to do um, the studying. Um, put it in your diary. Calen diarize it. Have, have a calendar entry that says it's half an hour at this time where this is all I'm going to do. Um, it's, it's partly about helping them time manage, I guess. Um, yeah. Really. I guess that, 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 you know, brings us to one of the final questions. Okay. Uh, it's time management, isn't it? And, and I was just talking this with you prior to recording this is, is we don't have very much time to think in our days or in our weeks, in our months, even years. I don't know, there, there, there might've been a period in my life where I'm not proud of saying it, but it happened <clears throat> where I wasn't a thinker, mm. you know? but we, we value the time to think so much. It's so sacred. Yeah. Are you sharing lessons? I mean, because we, we, we are teachers and we're trying to teach high level Englisher, but do you sometimes go outside of that box and talk about time management, maybe career planning and other areas like that to help our students? Um, yes, but, but you do it in the context of what you're trying to achieve. Mm. So if you have a goal, there are a range of things that need to, need to be um, met in order to achieve that goal. And so we, you know, I will talk about having a proper schedule for self-study. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, you know, what I was explaining to you is that as a student, I have to block out periods of time in my calendar when I can do my studies, because I know that I need a minimum of three hour period just to think, get into it and start writing. Mm -hmm. um, I can't just pick it up as and when. Mm -hmm. I have to have a diary entry that says, stop the clocks, this is the period of time where I'm doing this work nice. and so I try to instill that you you we arrange the client sessions to be as regular as possible so that they can then arrange around that their own time and as you know you know we're, we're encouraged to think outside the box and ask them how do you get to work ah so you're you're not driving okay so you're in a bus you're in a train and you have a mobile phone you could be learning language. You could be practicing um, an Anki set of vocabulary mm. while you're sitting on, on your commute. Mm. There are lots of times that you can carve out in your day, um, which might otherwise be quite unproductive. Mm. Um, and I think that when you schedule time, your focus on making them productive, um, making your thinking time available to yourself um, will give you much more benefit key. Um, than just trying to do it when you that's key and for the coaches i just wanted to summarize there is is letting the uh, clients know that hey uh, if our class starts at eight we can start at eight but you should know yourself and mm -hmm. being able to turn on that switch for your english brain and communicating in english having that article ready having some of your talking points ready um you may have to Come to class a little earlier to get yeah. to the zone right and that's a discussion that i that we should have with our clients right yeah. mm. wonderful yeah now yeah. it's also also what we have to do too um you know i i i try to make sure that there is a gap between if i have classes all on the same day that there's a gap between them so that i can then switch re, re although i'm Although for, with a lot of clients, I'm covering the same topics and we're doing it from different angles. We're using different articles to explore it and they're working in different industries. Um, so you, you, 
you also need to be mindful of the fact that you have to come prepared mm -hmm. um, in order to lead something. 100%. All right. Neil, any closing remarks, any wisdom to embark, uh, to, to share with, with our coaches that are tuning in? Because we've got some new ones. We always yeah. have new ones. But we also have our veteran coaches that are always watching. And so yeah. anything that you can share with them? Um, I, I doubt I can teach the veteran coaches anything, but they, and so they will know, but it's the ability to be adaptable, I think is really important. Um, watch your client, get to know your client and, and, and recognize the signals when we have an expression in the, in, in South Africa, where we say, where people who use English as a second or third language say that they're, their English levels are depleted. Um, they, they might have had a whole day of engaging in English, and by the evening, they're just struggling <laughs> to put sentences together. Like and <laughs> so, so what you do then is you ease off the pedal, you slow down the pace, um, get them to do some reading, focus on pronunciation, hmm. little exercises. Don't try and have a debate around... Um, the future of the automobile and smart transport systems, but talk about, uh, you know, as I say, read something, um, put simple sentences into different um, order, um, work on some synonyms, um, adjust yourself to their energy levels uh, and the pace at which they can learn for that particular session and know that each session will be different. It's kind of the approach I take. Adaptability, that's the key word today. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. Neil, a lot of golden nuggets today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and summarize those points, share it with our audience. Um, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Thank you. Being an amazing coach for our clients. You're, I know because I talk with your clients. Okay. <laughs> They speak volumes about you, so thank you. They're also great. I love the conversations we have. They they inspire me, and it's brilliant. It's it's such a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Neil. You have a great summer. <laughs> that sounds thank so you. weird. <laughs> <laughs> have a great summer over there, and um, I'll see you. Okay. Yeah. See you soon. Cheers. <laughs>